Hello, how's everyone doing today? Mine is numb from all the knowledge you've been gaining over the last uh, few hours. I guess not. <laughs> okay, well, I want to share with you some of my experiences that I've been through that have helped me create myself into a new person, to be innovative, to, be re to re regenerate yourself from failures, from horrific failures, from the space shuttle blowing up, to me losing all of my hearing and trying to figure out how I was going to go with that next step and what I was going to do with myself. So I know the financial markets and things have been in turmoil for many, many years. You're trying to figure out how to balance this, this new, um, these new markets with your clients and so forth. And so reinvention, creativity, uh, knowledge, learning, ingenuity, are all things that are required for that innovative, disruptive spark. And I want to share some of the things on the slides you see above and beyond a moment in silence. Um, three things that have defined me in the last probably 12 years of my life have been flying in space as an astronaut. Also STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. How do we inspire that next generation of explorers to see themselves in your positions or my position or in ways that we can actually help advance our civilization? What happens if that 10 kilometer in diameter asteroid comes and wipes out our planet? Is it over? Are we over? Are we living off planet? Are we going to Mars? Are we going to the moon? How do we do these types of things to save our civilization? And then also exploration. That's something that you do every day, exploring new ways to find in, um, creative solutions to problems. And so when I think of turning on this remote control, <laughs> there we go. I think of myself as a, a young kid a long time ago, and I grew up in a, a community that really had my back. I mean, if I did something in school, I could get a spanking in school, and then on my way home, if I dropped by my neighbor's house, I would get a spanking there because they had this community, this network that was making sure that I did the right thing. And in this day and time, you don't have that. You will get sued if you spank someone else's child. <laughs> But this community helped me um, believe myself, first of all, and then be able to do anything that I dreamt. My parents were both middle school teachers that when my dad brought a bread truck into the driveway, it was a Merida bread truck, he said, this is our camper. I'm like, what do you mean? That's a bread truck. It says Merida bread on the side of the truck. But he had a vision for something bigger than a bread truck. We built bunk beds, we put Coleman stoves, we did all these things to this bread truck. We reinvented that bread truck into our RV, our recreational vehicle. And so having a vision and seeing things that don't look like what you want them to be takes that creativity, ingenuity. Chemistry, if you read my bio, I was a chemistry major in college. Now, when I was about seven years old, my mother gave me an age-inappropriate chemistry set. Okay. We have this organization, uh, OSHA, that gives regulations for making sure that kids have age-appropriate things. Well, before they came along, my mom gave me this set, and I created the most intense explosion in her living room, burning a hole in her carpet. But that one moment fueled my curiosity, and I became a chemistry major. And so I think of that explosion unleashing fire and brimstone in my mother's house. And that resulted in a hand in my development. <laughs> but that hand in my development led me to so many different things. I was the only astronaut to play in the National Football League. And that was a very, very interesting uh, path for me. If you look here, I played football when I was a very young kid. In high school, I was a wide receiver. Now, football to you guys is a totally different thing. I know that. Everyone else in the world calls football, it means soccer, you know, it means something else to us. But I was a senior in high school. We were down by one touchdown. I was flanked out, about to run down the sideline to catch this winning touchdown. So I'm lined up, I'm running down the sideline, and the crowd is screaming, scream crowd. The crowd is screaming, I'm running, I'm running, the ball is coming in my hands, what do you think happened? I dropped a touchdown pass in my hands, in the end zone. Unbeknownst to me, there was a college scout from the University of Richmond looking to see if I could play for them. 
after dropping this pass in my hands, he turned around and walked out of the stadium. I went to the sideline, waiting to get it put on the bench, and my coach looked me in the eyes, coach, and he says, get back out there and catch the ball. I'm lined up, running down the sideline. This time I'm running, Lord, please let me catch this ball. <laughs> Ball's coming, crowd screaming, I caught it, we won the game. The scout who saw me drop a touchdown pass, heard the crowd screaming, came back, looked over in the stands, and saw me dancing in the end zone. <laughs> he said, maybe if he can come back from such a horrific failure, maybe he can play for us. That taught me a big lesson, not giving up on yourself, believing in yourself, and other people believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. That one catch resulted in a $180,000 scholarship to the University of Richmond to play with the football team there. Perseverance, dedication, not giving up, were all the things that we must do in any industry. And when, when, the, when the, the, the times get really tough and your people are giving up on you, that's when you really buckle down and say, this is something that I believe in and I want to do. After uh, catching that pass, I went and played for the University of Richmond for four years and got drafted to the Detroit Lions in the 11th round. The second week in training camp, I pulled a hamstring muscle. Hamstrings are pretty important to wide receivers, um, and that was the end of my football career, which I thought. I went to the Dallas Cowboys. They pract we practiced for a little bit, and they signed me for the next season. And while I waited to go to the, to the Cowboys, I started graduate school at the University of Virginia Material Science Engineering. It's kind of crazy. By day, I'm catching footballs for America's team. By night, I'm watching electrochemistry and material science engineering for, for this master's degree program. But when I ended my uh, career with one more hamstring injury pull, that led me to just becoming, uh, getting a master's degree in material science engineering and then going to work for NASA. And at NASA, I was in charge of doing some pretty incredible research facilities. If you look at the bottom right corner, that's a, an optical fiber sensor. And we use these fibers to measure temperature, strain, and chemical species in our aerospace vehicles. This is one of the vehicles I worked on, the X-33 program, non-destructive evaluation. How do we make measurements, tech, uh, measurements and systems so that people don't have to go out there and scan them by their hand, by hand. And uh, this vehicle was one to replace the shuttle. Um, this technology was incredible. We did a lot of patents. We had some, some really great advances. And then a friend of mine walked up to me and he said, Leland, you'd be a great astronaut. I'm like, me? You know, I never thought about becoming an astronaut before. He said, you'd be a great astronaut. He handed me the application. I looked at it and I sat it down, didn't fill it out. That same year, a buddy of mine filled the application out and he got in. And I said to myself, if NASA's letting knuckleheads like that in <laughs> to become astronauts, maybe I should apply and get in too. And so uh, that next selection, I applied and I got into the astronaut corps. Now, can you guys see me in the picture anywhere? <laughs> where's, where's Leland? Is he in the front row there, in the back? I got a little diversity there. Um, <laughs> But the important thing is, we had people from all around the world working together. We had uh, 25 US astronauts. We had uh, the first um, Brazilian astronaut. We had um, two Italian, uh, French, German. It was a, a truly an international uh, class in the 1998 class. And that's me flying the high performance jets. I'd never flown before. And then one of the first things we do as astronauts is we go through basic training, astronaut training. Um, you see us there training, uh, land survival training. We have to be, be able to take care of ourselves if we have to get ejected out of the, um, the airplane. So basic land survival skills. And then we also do water survival skills after this. We, you know, here we make fires. We use our parachutes to make shelter for ourselves. We um, you know, trap rabbits and bunnies and eat you know, cockroaches and things like that all ways to prepare yourself to, to survive until after you get back. Um, on, this, uh, on this training session, we had all of our, our crewmates and our classmates, and then we went to Pensacola, Florida, and we started working, looking at how to save yourself if you eject out in the ocean. How to get picked up by a helicopter, 
how do you, um, you know, pump up your, your life preserver if it's not working automatically, stupid astronaut tricks, these kinds of things we do as, as astronauts. Um, and then how to, how to actually get in, and if you get in the water, if you don't come out of your parachute quickly, you can be dragged through the water and drowned. So again, all things to preserve your life and liberty as an astronaut when you come out of this, uh, out of this training. After that, we have something we do, the T-38 training. I so I never had flown before. This is a dual cockpit air, airplane. And uh, you learn how to fly in the back. You know, for crew, we call it crew cockpit um, resource management. When you work together as a team and fly in the shuttle, you depend on everyone to do their particular role and job to ensure that everyone is safe and sound. And then after this training, we go through um, something where we have an airplane, it's a 737, that we take all the seats out and allows us to fly inside of that to simulate weightlessness. Now, this plane is affectionately called the Vomit Comet because some people usually get sick in this airplane. Um, here we are, we can pull, um, we do about 40 parabolas and we can get 25 seconds of weightlessness in this airplane. And we do this to get ready for a space flight. Now, I had never imagined myself going to space one day. And I think about, you know, all the people before me that have had those opportunities. When I was selected and then went into my training in this place called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, the, the big pool on the bottom, it's about a six million gallon pool that we simulate weightlessness. So we're able to go in there and do spacewalks in this pool with, in the white suit. This was one of my biggest challenges in my life because when I got in the suit, they, they started to lower me down into the water column. My, um, I looked at my helmet and I noticed that this little plastic, um, it's like a little plastic pad that sits right on the front of your neck dam. That pad is used so that you can press your nose against it to clear your ears if you have to because you can't reach your, your hand in there. They forgot to put mine in. And after about 20 feet down, I called the test director and asked him to turn the volume in the headset up on my, on my helmet. And uh, I heard static and I heard white noise in both ears. They took me out of the water. They looked at me they popped my helmet off. And the doctor who walked up to me, he was talking to me. He said, I'm like, why is he playing with me? Why isn't he saying anything? Lo and behold, I had lost all my hearing. This, uh, the, the loss of not having that pad in there did not allow me to clear my ears. I didn't blow any eardrums or anything like that, but they think that there's a, there's a path into your inner ear from your spinal column, the spinal fluid that goes in there. They think that I was straining so hard that I ruptured my inner ear from the inside, which can then let sodium and potassium and different um, um, uh, electrolytes damage the hair cells. And so I was deaf for probably about three weeks. I was in the hospital, my hearing started coming back. But the flight surgeon said, you will never fly in space because we don't know why this happened to you. And so this was, you know, this was a moment in time, a moment in silence that I just really wondered what I was gonna do with my life, what was gonna be my next steps. And you know, my hearing did come back and this year, it's pretty, pretty bad in my left ear. But that's when I said, you know, I'm going to stay with NASA. I'm not going to quit. People wanted me to quit NASA and actually go sue NASA and get paid lots of money. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. So I went and started working in education, STEM education at the time, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This was in Washington, DC at NASA headquarters. And we were kicking off a program to help inspire educators to fly in space, the Educator Astronaut Program. This was in 2000, 2003, we started in January. And then one month later, February 1st, 2003, we lost the Space Shuttle Columbia. How many of you rem remember the Space Shuttle Columbia breaking up over the Texas sky? I had, they were all good friends of mine, but the gentleman in the top left corner, David Brown, we were gonna do a photography shoot when he got back from space. David never made it home. And on the night of the accident, I went to his parents' home in Washington, Virginia, and his dad looked me in the eyes and he said, Leland, my son is gone. 
There is nothing you can do to bring him back. But the biggest tragedy would be if we don't continue to find space to carry on the legacy. So I think about you know, this moment in time. I'm never going to find space because the doctors have told me I'm medically disqualified and they will never let me find space. David's father planted this seed in me to do whatever I can in my power to help inspire that next generation of explorers to not forget this legacy. I think about legacy that my father left me. I think about legacy that the people in the community left me to keep believing in myself and to keep moving forward. We flew around the country to go to all the different memorial services, the seven memorial services. And as we flew around the country, the chief flight surgeon was sitting beside me on every flight. I don't know why he was sitting there. I saw that he had a notebook. He was writing notes every time we took off and every time we landed. And when the program that I was working on in, in Washington was ending, I was heading back to Houston to try to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And the chief flight surgeon called me in his office and he said, Leland, he says, I've been watching you. He says, I saw every time we, we took off and we landed, I saw you press your nose and clear your ears. I said, there's no reason why you cannot fly in space. And so he wrote me a waiver to fly. It's like a get out of jail free card, you know. <laughs> Took it back to Houston and the, all the flight surgeons there were just stymied. But their, their boss had said there was no reason why he can't fly. He can fly in the shuttle. It's pressurized. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, we don't have to worry about that. If something happens to the shuttle from the pressurization, everybody's in trouble. So there's no reason why Leland can't fly. If I hadn't have gone and taken that job in Washington, if I had quit NASA, if I had done all these things, I would have never have had the opportunity to be there for David Brown and the Columbia crew. I never would have had a chance to think about helping teachers become astronauts. And so sometimes when we think about a path, that path is, can be very serendipitous to getting to the solution that you want. And in this case, I didn't know what that final outcome was going to be. But I did go with my gut. I went with my instincts. I went with my, my dreams and desires and things that I believed in. And that led me to flying in space. The nation paused after Columbia. President Bush mentioned many times to NASA headquarters senior leadership that we don't know if we're going to keep this program going. And as we piece back what exactly happened to this vehicle, we questioned whether NASA would even be in existence after this accident. There was a lot of discussion about canceling the shuttle program. The shuttle program was the feeder to get us the hardware to get to the space station. If we didn't have the International Space Station, that would be decommissioned. So what would be the purpose of NASA? And that was at a very challenging time. Um, you can see the pieces, parts that were found of the Colombian trying to, to reconstitute it. When you think about what actually happened on the vehicle, it was a serious management issue. It wasn't a technical issue. It was a failure in the management chain. You can see here the piece of foam hitting the tile on the, on the wing there. And this was, uh, this was something that happened. But as an engineer, a, a lower level engineer, went to their management and said, hey, we think there could be a problem with the wing. And because that manager did not have the creativity to believe that something could wipe out or put a hole big enough in the wing that would take down the entire shuttle, was the downfall of this orbiter and my friend's lives. So when you think about getting solutions to problems, listening to everyone to make that decision is just critical in any industry or any business. And we had to reinvent ourselves from a management standpoint at NASA because of that, that lack of, of transparency upwards and downwards in the organization. This was a picture I took when I got assigned to fly in space for the first time. I didn't have family in Houston, so they said, you can take the picture with your family. I took my dogs. I sent my dogs in the NASA to take this picture. And this was uh, my first flight, STS-122, launched in February of 2008. And I think about what we did. You know, this is a 
starting to dock to the space station. You see the space station. You see the top right, there's a robotic arm. My job was to take the robotic arm and install the Columbus Laboratory, which was the European Space Agency's research laboratory to the International Space Station. Now, before getting this assignment, before getting to space, when I met with all the German flight controllers who had been working on this program for about 10 years, and they said, you're going to install this vehicle, this, this module, onto the space station. And they said, we've been waiting 10 years. And they're high-fiving me, they're chest-bumping me, and they're walking out of the room. And one German gentleman comes up to me and he says, Mr. Melvin, we've been waiting 10 years. Don't screw it up. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. So when I get up there, I take this arm, we install the Columbus module, and as we're about to get it close to the space station, the motion starts stalling out. And I'm, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, don't screw it up. But a little more pull, and we made this installation. People always ask me, what was the most incredible thing that you know, happened to you in space? Was it installing the Columbus Laboratory? Was it, what was the, the most incredible thing? I always tell them, the most incredible thing that happened in space was when we broke bread with people we used to fight against. If you look in this picture, you see Hans and Yuri, Russia and Germany, we used to fight against them. We're having this meal at 17,500 miles per hour going around the planet at that speed, 240 miles up, every 90 minutes, or every 45 minutes seeing a sunrise and a sunset. And I think about how far we've come as a civilization. We have the first female commander, Dr. Peggy Whitson. I'll let you know how far we've come. We even have hot sauce, because your taste buds are fairly deactiv deactivated in space. You want your food to be spicier. But I think about this type of, of thing. It's like a Benetton commercial with people from all around the world working together as one civilization. And then I think about as we were Having this moment, we were going over Iraq and Afghanistan and these places where there's social unrest and war. And the space experience, looking down at the planet from this perspective, it changes you in such a fundamental way. It gives you something called an orbital perspective or an orbital shift. It's like when I was driving down the Highway 45 in Houston before launch and someone cuts me off, I would have might have said, hey, bloop, 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 bloop. But coming back home, I'm like, oh, it's OK. I've been to space. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, does, it does fundamentally change you. you know? You're not as mad when someone cuts you off. You know? it's, just, it's a lot different. And this blue planet, 75% water, looking down on it from that perspective, I think it could, it could help so many people find and see things in different ways. My second flight was STS-129. I flew on a special Atlantis again, so I'm a kind of an Atlantis flying kind of guy. Um, this was in November of 2009, and the morning before launch, you walk out and you hear this vehicle hissing and breathing and talking to you before you get in it. It's just one of the most incredible sights. My job for this mission was also to do robotics. Because of my hearing loss, I couldn't do a spacewalk. They would not let me fly the T-38s anymore or get back in the big pool since the big pool hurt me. So I was in charge of making sure that everything robotics-wise got installed on the space station. We finished the shuttle. Um, the shuttle was ended in uh, 2011, July of 2011. So all of these missions were to take up all the spare parts and the modules and the things to build out the rest of the space station. You know, coming back home, you're starting to build the, the Gs back up. You know, we always think of Columbia as we come, you know, as we start to re-enter the atmosphere. It takes about an hour to get home. Um, it's an incredible dead stick flight. There is no propulsion. There is no fuel left. You have to nail it the first time because there is no do-over and no go-around. And that's where the teamwork comes in, that you trust the person beside you with your life. It's not only with your life, it's with the, the program. Another shuttle accident could mean the end of the program. It could mean the end of NASA. So that kind of pressure was on us. But we all know that the training, the diligence, the teamwork, the knowledge, all those things 
brought us through to ensure that we had a successful mission. And our commander, Charlie Hobaugh, he nailed it right down the center line. It's just an incredible time. And some of, the, some of the things that I've learned from working with highly functioning teams, like when things start going wrong. I mean, in space, we had all kinds of things happen. We had to redo them in space. And it was not giving up. It was believing yourself and getting through that. After flying in space, I hung up my space boots and I took a job at NASA headquarters working in education. And I think of the times that my parents, who were both educators, how they transform our community, how people to this day come up to me to tell me if it wasn't for your mother, if it wasn't for your father, I would have been dead or in jail or on drugs. And I think about how we can help change our civilization through the advancement of technology and education. If you look at this picture, there are four pictures. Uh, this is Will I Am on the bottom left. He's a recording artist in the US. He wrote a song called Reach for the Stars. And in this song, we transmitted this song from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, to the space network of TDRS satellites down to the Martian surface to the rover Curiosity. And then we beamed it back from Mars back to the planet to kick off a program to get kids inspired around STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And so after flying, I was trying to figure out what am I going to do with my life? What, how can I take these, these things that I've, I've, uh, I've done and accomplished and help share that with other people? If you look on the bottom right, this was an activity we did at the Smithsonian with kids. And then the top left, it was a virtual um, connection with students from all over the world where we were showing them presentations and things through avatars. These were all avatars that, that everyone made themselves into. After that, I was working with the White House to see how we can transform STEM education in the US. And we had 14 federal agencies working together to try to come up with this document to be presented to the President and Congress. Now, trying to work with 14 federal agencies is like having a koala bear and a kangaroo mate. You know, it just doesn't work, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, this was a, another leadership challenge because everyone had their budgets, everyone had their own way of doing things, and we finally briefed Congress on how we're going to try to do this, this education thing. And um, this was one of the most challenging, I think, it was probably harder than flying in space because you have these different personalities, you have these different organizations, and you have budget that everyone wants to make sure that they keep their budget and don't combine budgets with yours. Um, some of the other things that we're doing in this area for human exploration, we're looking at Earth-reliant systems to get us off planet. Again, I mentioned earlier, what if that 10 kilometer in diameter asteroid hits? How do we save our civilization? Those are the types of things, looking from an orbital perspective, how do we advance ourselves as a civilization? Uh, getting to Mars one day in, in uh, the 2030s is something that we're looking at doing, having an outpost on an, another Mar Martian planet. Some other technologies that are being used right now, uh, Robert Bigelow is looking at, in the top left corner, using inflatable habitats up on the space station where people where tourists can come and actually live there and work there. Virgin Galactic is going to have Spaceship Two launching with paid customers, hopefully in December, January time frame. Um, these are all innovative uh, entrepreneurs that are doing things that are cutting edge state of the art. Uh, we have on the bottom right, we have Morpheus, which is a, a vehicle for taking off and landing horizontally. It's a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. But again, ways that you can use disruptive technologies to see how we can go to the next, to the next level technologically. On Monday, I'm going to be working on a program to help democratize space, where we give people the dollars to fly on these four carriers, XCOR, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic. It's like a, a, a crowdfunding model for, for getting people to fly in space. And I think once more people have this orbital shift, have this opportunity to see our planet from this, this different perspective, things will definitely change on the planet. Definitely have more politicians going to space to get that orbital shift so they can work better together. 
walking in the air, orbital perspective, overcoming adversity, not giving up, believing in yourself, and believing in the people that surround you.